Many of you know that I've been offering commentaries during Advent here in the parish on uh, Father Richard Rohr's uh, wonderful new book, Universal Christ. So I'll be referring to him in some of what I said last night as well, and also be name dropping in the process. Uh, You know, we get so used to the Christmas message, and it is very touching. You know, we have the the uh, crib and the stable and the newborn babe and the shepherds, and etc. But that's why it's important to have this morning's gospel as well. Not in opposition to that, but to understand more deeply the full dimensions of what exactly is happening and what its import is. You know, the decree going forth from Caesar Augustus and going to Bethlehem is the Midnight Mass Gospel, traditionally, and was last night. But this morning, the main Mass, Christmas Day, is always the prologue of St. John, which we just read. And if anybody asks you or anybody, what's the Gospel for Christmas? They would say, oh, the stable in Bethlehem. Yes and no. The Gospel for Christmas Day is the prologue of John which is not a different mystery, but you get a a sense of the full dimensions of the mystery because you start with the Word of God. God. The Word of God who is God, with God, is God, as it says, begins by saying. And all things were created through him. Now, the universal Christ, and this is something that only, not only... uh, Richard Rohr, but Ilya de Lille, the contemporary Franciscan theologian, and Ramon Panicar, the famous Catalonian priest and interfaith theologian, they pointed this out, and it's a little bold in its formulation, but it says, you know, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. Christ is the eternal Christ, which then became personal in Jesus of Nazareth. But the eternal Christ is eternal, as we just heard. All things were made through him. Without him was not made anything that was made. So the first incarnation, or if you will, to be less controversial, the first manifestation of the unmanifested Father, the first manifestation in the world, which is, of course, what epiphany means, is the universe. That's the first incarnation. You know, strictly speaking, when God first manifests in creation. That's the first one. And the, the other readings today, the second, the second reading affirms that, does it not? He's the refulgence of eternal light, his own son, God's son. The very stamp of his being, upholding all things by the word of his power, through whom cre- he created the whole universe, it says. Right there again. Or the very famous passage, the first chapter of Colossians, which says, all things were made through him, through this Christ. He is before all things, in him all things hold together. All things were created through him and for him. All things. It says later in the same epistle, Christ is all in all. Which sounds pretty inclusive. Christ is is all in all. So we first have to be able to discern Christ, meet Christ, in nature. God wasn't just waiting around for a couple of billion years for us to come along and finally get ready for the Bible or the coming of Jesus of Nazareth. He's already speaking to us, already present to us. And I like what Richard says very well. Don't give the second Bible the written Bible, to anybody who can't understand the first one. And St. Bernard said the same thing. The first scripture, the first Bible is nature. And here we are, quotes Christians, you know, just exploit and abuse nature. It's just a backdrop to our drama. We don't understand our drama if we don't understand the whole of creation and the fact that it is the incarnate is Christ. Christ is present, all things made through him and for him. So we start with that. And then, yes, the light 
this eternal light, which is our life, it says in the prologue, comes into the world. The, he was in the world already, it says. Why do we skip over that part? He was already in the world, as I just explained. But now he was coming in a new way, an individualized, personal way, in and as Jesus of Nazareth. Paul says very beautifully to the Corinthians, and it's, this is a little chapter reading in our monastic liturgy for Christmas Day. The very God who said, let light shine in the darkness, the first line of Genesis, let light shine in the darkness, has shone also in our hearts to make known the light of the glory of God shining in the face of Christ. So this light of all creation, this eternal light that Christ is, now is shining in and through the face of Jesus. How? How is that light shining? And here's where we come back to the stable with a whole new set of eyes, I hope. And there's actually an op-ed piece in the Times today about the very thing I'm about to explain. So check that out. The Christ turns our world upside down. Christmas turns our world upside down. Because how did this light, this eternal word, this eternal glory of God, how did it come into the world? In a backwater of the Roman Empire. To a couple of peasants, or if you will, just a couple of poor people who were nobodies socially who were marginalized. He didn't come to the high priests. He didn't come to the emperor. He came to the shepherds. He came as a helpless, helpless little child. Poor, silent, having nothing, knowing nothing, being nothing, in a sense, in that infancy. That's who God is. That's who this eternal word is. Poor, humble, silent. You notice? Poor, humble, silent. Having nothing. In a sense, being nothing. In a sense, knowing nothing. In that infant. Wow, that's a revelation. I mean, it's repeated. I mean, right here in this church, we have Bernadette and Mary, the mother of God. To whom did she appear? Napoleon III? The Bishop of Lourdes? No. To someone very like Mary, a little teenage nobody. What does that tell us about God and about ourselves? As Father Daniel Horan, the young Franciscan theologian, says, and Elizabeth Johnson, the wonderful uh, contemporary theologian from Fordham, retired from Fordham, said, God became flesh. Didn't you just hear that? The word became flesh. It doesn't say the word became human. The word became flesh. And the word sarx in Greek, the same as basar in Hebrew, means the very poverty and fragility and weakness and ephemeral quality of created matter. God took that on. God is able to reveal God's self precisely in that and through that and as that. Beginning from the beginning of time. But here, especially in Jesus of Nazareth. So what does that tell us again about God? It's good to be flesh. I wish we'd preached that more over 2,000 years. God help us. It's good to be flesh. It's good to be human. It's good to be weak and ephemeral and passing and poor, as we inevitably and always are by our very nature. It's okay. God is there. God is expressed through that. This very op-ed piece in the Times today points out that passage from Corinthians where Paul learned finally it's in weakness that God's strength is shown. So I'm content, he says, with my weakness so that the power of Christ, weakness of God, can be expressed in me. And that's what Paul says to the Corinthians also. The wisdom of God, the power of God, is the crucified Christ. 
weakness, foolishness, as Paul says, is the wisdom of God and the power of God. How many Christians through the centuries and even today understand, have really gotten that? The weakness, the suffering, the ephemeral quality, the sarks, the flesh. It's where you find God, where God manifests God's self. So if we're, pe- if we're feeling weak and poor and full of doubts, not knowing anything, not having anything, not being anything, congratulations. That's where you can meet God. That's where God reveals God's self. Not in our moral perfection and all our pretenses and all our power and all our riches and all these things that Christians seem to like so much. No. That's where God shows God's self. Hmm? And then finally, the third prong of this. What does God do then with this weakness? God takes it on. Many mystics, Sufi mystics, Christian mystics, have suggested that, yeah, Christ came to redeem us from sin, but Duns Scotus, the great medieval Franciscan theologian, and others have said he would have come anyway. He was already here in that first incarnation, so to speak. But he wanted to take on flesh. He wanted to, maybe he wanted to experience it for himself. God wanted to know what it was like to be created to be in one person, created and uncreated, eternal and temporal. And then by that same dynamic, to share that with us. As the opening prayer says, this traditional hundred-year-old, hundreds of years old opening prayer says, he came to share our humanity so that we might share his divinity. He came to share our life so that we might share his life. And as Richard says very well, once you have God's eternal, infinite life, the life, that, the light that is the light of the human race, enter into our flesh, our weakness. Once you have the incarnation in that ultimate sense, definitive sense, the resurrection is a done deal. The resurrection is the logical, inevitable conclusion of the incarnation. And yes, as the Paschal Mystery notes, and as nature shows us, It passes through death, passes through crucifixion, but that's okay. That's where God reveals God's self. The incarnation in our weakness and then the weakness brought up into the life of God, as we see in the resurrected Christ. And this is where Jesus and Christ really come together in the resurrection, because now, not only in his divinity, But in his humanity, his wounded humanity, resurrected, even in his humanity, he's coterminous with the universe. Already in the divinity, the eternal Christ, but now the eternal Christ is also in Jesus of Nazareth, as Jesus of Nazareth. His whole humanity embraces the whole of creation. This is not just new age. I'm not making this up. Pope John Paul said the same thing in one of his encyclicals. The Christ is united to everyone and everything in the universe. Hmm. And how could it be otherwise? In him all things were made, all things were redeemed. Hmm. So Christ takes up everything, and he transforms us more and more into himself. In the Eucharist, the sacraments, prayer, our daily lives, our service, every moment of our life is another way of Christ living his life in us. That's where we're ultimately moving here, sharing his divinity. Christ is living his own life, human and divine, as one in and through us. So that ultimately, if we have the courage and the guts to allow God to bring his project to completion in us, we can say with, Christ, with Paul to the Galatians, it's no longer I who live. I'm subsumed into Christ. It is Christ who lives in me, Paul says, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Christ lives his life in us, and that's our ultimate identity and our ultimate joy. People like Cynthia Bourgeau, the contemporary spiritual writer, and Teilhard de Chardin, the wonderful uh, Jesuit uh, uh, scientist and mystic from the last century, 
He says it's all moving towards the omega point. The whole universe is evolving towards Christ, towards the human resurrected Christ. The sacred heart is the center of the universe. I mean, do we feel that? Do we know that? Do we want that? Because it's, we are part of that. We are that. Christ is living, hopefully living, able to live his life of love and compassion and justice and peace and transformation of the world into the kingdom of God in and through us. He only has our hands now and our heart now, as St. Teresa of Jesus says. Do we allow Christ to be our life as he is? Just allow to be what is and find your truth, your happiness, your joy, your identity, your eternal destiny in that, in him, as him, as he. That's the promise of Christmas. Not just the latest gift that Santa brought, but the greatest gift that the Father brought, which is Jesus in us, as us, and through us for all eternity.